So it's 6 p.m. our side, and I know it's much, much earlier your side, uh, Hannah. So I think let's get started officially. Uh, we may have some folks join us probably uh, from now uh, as well. So I'm uh, Dr. Nicola Pallet, and I'm part of the Emerge Africa team, and I work at Rhodes University. And today we've got a very special friend um, and speaker, uh, Dr. Hannah M. Grossman, who's going to be sharing about using trauma-informed approaches to support instruction uh, for COVID-19 and also beyond. So I'm going to share a quick intro, just a, a bio sketch of Hannah, um, but she'll give us some more detail pretty soon. So Hannah's a, a PhD and instructional designer for the National Center for Child Traumatic Stress. She specializes in adult learning using a cognitive load framework to create contextually embedded guiding principles for product design and development. Her work spans low literacy, skill-based learning, uh, cross-cultural collaboration, design-based research, social emotional learning, trauma-informed instructional and process design, and problem-based learning. So over to you, Hannah. Thank you, Nicola. It was very appreciated. So basically, I'm going to summarize myself. My passion is making information accessible to learners. In my applied work, I specialize in the instructional design side. And my work is based in the cognitive science framework. And I do a lot of work in the creation of experiential and problem-based curriculum and instruction for both formal and informal learning situations. While I'm talking about trauma today, that is the work field I work in, not my area of expertise. I tend to be rather informal in my presentation, and we can be flexible to the needs of everyone on the call. Now, even at the very beginning of what I'm going to be talking about, I want to say that discussing trauma is complicated and it ties very deeply to our identities as people, not just as educators. And as we're going to discuss the sensitive topic, I'd appreciate it if we could try to build a safe place to share ideas and understanding. If at all possible on this call, if you can approach the work and the conversation with kindness in the way you see the information and your interpretation, that'll go a long way to making this a place where we can all think and talk together. I have the video showing who I am so you can see me and I feel like more of a real person, but for bandwidth reasons, I'm going to stop my video now. Now, in this conversation, we'll go through a little bit of the cognitive load framing. We'll get some tr foundational trauma information. We'll look at SAMHSA's six trauma-informed approaches. We'll look at the application of these trauma-informed approaches to current learning contexts. And then we'll conclude with some conversations on secondary traumatic stress. So, Let's begin talking about a cognitive load framework and how cognitive load would affect a conversation on trauma to begin with. When I approach traumatic stress and its role in learning, I approach that from a cognitive load perspective. Very simply, there is mental work associated with paying attention and processing through a task, any task. Different learning tasks add different loads to the learning process. The work of a learning task is known as its cognitive load. Now, recognizing that every interaction you have has cognitive load, and that's something you need to pay attention to when you're creating your learning situations, helps in learning across the board, not just from a trauma-informed perspective, but it helps even more greatly from a trauma-informed perspective, as we'll learn. Now, cognitive load has a trade-off. We can do really well when our cognitive loads are balanced. But when your cognitive load becomes too much and gets overloaded, for every single human, once you hit overloaded, 
learning, motivation, and collaboration skills go down. So a big part of using cognitive load as a frame for instructional design is keeping your cognitive load balanced enough that you can have high levels of learning, high levels of motivation, and good quality collaboration in your learning situation. Now humans are very social creatures, and we are actually biologically primed to pay attention to social and emotional loads first. Through our evolution over time, these loads are what kept us alive in times of strife and trouble. The loads related to other people and working together as a team and balancing. Because of our historical reliance on these loads, nowadays they, these loads greatly influence success and power and interaction. Now when we think about our framing for learning, we very seldom frame our learning recognizing that these social emotional loads are biologically primary in the way we frame things. So if we ignore social emotional loads in planning learning, we're gonna be inaccurate in assessing the learning situation because our students with high social emotional loads for example, our students that are experiencing traumatic reminders, they're not going to have the cognitive load to deal with a high level of cognitive load with the learning situation because all of their attention is going to be spent on the social emotional load. This is really easy to see in times when you do have a natural disaster or a trauma. If your house is on fire, you're gonna have a really hard time concentrating on doing your math problem. If there is police presence in your streets that are causing riots and trouble, focusing on making sure that you're writing your English essay correctly might not be as important as wondering how your family is. So these loads are going to really influence the learning situation, whether or not you pay attention to them. So as an instructional designer, it's very meaningful to pay attention to these loads. So that begs the question, what is trauma? Because if trauma loads are heavy, we should know what it is and what kind of things cause it. Trauma is complicated because individual trauma results from an event, a series of events, or a set of circumstances that is experienced by an individual as physically or emotionally harmful or life-threatening, and that has lasting adverse effects on the individual's functioning and mental, physical, social, emotional, or spiritual well-being. Let's break that down a little bit. Trauma is not defined by society. Trauma is defined by the individual. It is an experience or a series of experiences or an ex set of things that's happening your whole life that you as an individual feel you're physically or emotionally threatened. So you need to deal with that threat and you need to stop functioning in your normal way and deal with that threat. And after that threat, there are lasting adverse effects. So you can't say this is trauma and this isn't, or that is trauma and that isn't, because the trauma is defined by the individual. And when you're helping students with trauma, it's about helping them have the tools for themselves to deal with it, because you can't define it for them or tell them what tools are going to solve their problems. It's much more about facilitating and guiding. Now, this information, this definition of trauma, and most of the information associated with this presentation can be found in this one document. It's uh, the Substance Abuse and Mental Health uh, Association, Mental Health Services Association's Concept of Trauma and Guidance for a Trauma-Informed Approach. That document explains all of the 
trauma-informed approaches we're going to be talking about today in detail. And it's a very good resource if you want to continue thinking and working through this information. So now that we've understood a little bit about what could be trauma, let's talk about what happens after a traumatic situation. And the, more, the thing we're more concerned with in the classroom, trauma reminders. Some of you may have heard of trauma reminders as triggers. A trauma reminder can be a sight, a sound, or a smell. Basically, any memory that connects to a previous traumatic experience. Now this memory, when it connects to the previous traumatic experience, brings back the emotional reactions of feeling threatened and feeling fear for your life. And when you get those emotional reactions, you could become dysregulated. What is dysregulation? Where your emotions are not balanced, where your body's not balanced, where your breathing gets faster, your head may race, you might sweat. It's where your body is going into a stress response, an autonomic stress response, like fight or flight. And your body's getting prepared to deal with a traumatic life-threatening event. Even though the event has already passed, the memory brings the dysregulation back. Now, if it's a particularly strong trauma reminder, it might not just bring dysregulation, it might bring impulse control. Impulse control is where you get so lost in the reaction that you can no longer control yourself from a top-down conscious way and you're lost in the reaction. If you have a student that stands up and shouts in a classroom, very likely they're having impulse control issues. A key aspect of trauma reminders, dysregulation, and impulse control is knowing that if you are having these issues, it is very hard to learn the skills of how to deal with the, these issues in the moment. If you have a student screaming, it does not make sense to say, oh, don't scream, because they're having impulse control issues, they're not going to have the ability to stop themselves. At the moment when someone's in an impulse control issue, what you're gonna to wanna to do is actively listen, reason, keep them calm, get them thinking more breathing, making them feel heard. These are things that are going to make them feel less threatened. If you want them to learn the skills of controlling when they have been dysregulated and re-regulating themselves, or the skills of not hitting an impulse control mark and going over that and losing control, practice those skills in times of calmness. There is a lot of information on social emotional learning and how to get better at re-regulating yourself and how to get better at not getting as overwhelmed by impulse control issues. And these are great skills to practice, but these should be practiced when the system is regulated, when people are in low risk, relaxed setting. So, one last one of definitions in this foundational trauma information I want people thinking about before we even get into the trauma-informed approaches is secondary adversity. Secondary adversities add complexity to an already complex subject. Secondary adversities are additional problems that come up as a result of the traumatic situation happening. They add complexity and further difficulties in the already traumatic situation. For example, when your grandmother dies, you're going to have some really strong emotional responses to her being gone and missing her. And at the same time, you might have an additional 
secondary adversity of having to find someone else to do the childcare that your grandmother used to do. And now you have this extra problem that adds this extra stress into this already difficult situation. Secondary adversities happen regularly in the classroom when classroom information interacts with kids' existing trauma information. Uh, for example, if a teacher doesn't know a student's trauma history and then asks them to do an assignment based on a family that they may not know, they have that secondary adversity of trying to figure out what they should and what they shouldn't say and how to make that bridge between the lesson where they've already had the loss and how do they communicate that to the other audience. The big idea here is just secondary adversities make already complex subjects even more complex. And if you can identify these secondary adversities and remove as many as possible, you will make that learning situation stronger. So before we're gonna move on, the next set of information is about trauma-informed approaches for working with this foundational trauma information. But I thought I'd take a second to see if anyone wanted to share anything about the foundational trauma information they've heard. Um, there was a question by Manju around uh, whether students are punished by some institutions uh, when they're in fact, you know, working through impulse control. And I would say very definitely our schools are not aware of many of these social emotional issues and they are not part of a classical framing of education. And so very often teachers in schools will punish behaviors that would make more sense to help regulate a child or a learner and then help them learn the skills afterwards. So yes, the systems do very regularly punish them and I do not necessarily think that is the best way to handle that. And then there's another one here. Um, what are the strategies for removing trauma and secondary adversary issues? So that's actually going to be the next section is going into some of the trauma-informed approaches. And we'll look at some of those uh, strategies. Um, just one more question, Hannah. Uh, Zandi asked, is there um, research on the role of trauma in over-disciplining of students of color? Very definitely. There is research now and there continues to be research on how there are serious equity issues around over-disciplining groups of students based on cultural or behavioral differences where certain groups get punished more for the exact same behaviors as other groups. And that is something that needs to be seriously examined within our communities and societies. So going from this foundational trauma information, it can feel pretty bleak. It can feel hard to know what to do and how to approach making a positive classroom environment that is a good place for your students to learn. Traumatized students are devoting many cognitive resources to controlling and managing the social emotional reactions to traumatic re events. These learners have less cognitive resources to devote to the learning process. When trauma-informed approaches are included in the planning of instruction, it supports traumatized learners by reducing the cognitive loads associated with social-emotional processing. So just by using trauma-informed approaches, it is, makes it less likely to re-traumatize students or to make a student hit a traumatic reminder, so they're less likely to have difficulty with the learning situation. I, for this reason, think that a trauma-informed approach 
is actually universal design for all learners because any student might be coming in with unknown traumas. And if you prepare for all students having unknown traumas, then that makes the learning situation more positive for anyone that might. Now these are SAMHSA's six trauma-informed approaches. The first is safety. If I'm questioning my physical or my psychological safety in a learning situation, I'm not going to have as much time to think about the learning. If I'm afraid that if I say something, people will laugh at me or people will judge me badly, I'm not going to want to contribute as much. Trustworthiness and transparency. If you are my teacher and I am learning from you, if I do not trust that you are going to get me to the destination I'm trying to get to, I'm not going to be as invested in the learning. If your learning situation is structured in such a way that I can't understand the learning situation, if it's so opaque that I am lost, I am not going to learn nearly as much. So being trustworthy and being transparent in what you're trying to do and the goals of a learning situation can very much help the learner in the work. Peer support. Having learners support each other, sharing resources, sharing ideas, making it so that you're not alone in the process makes the learning safer. We're very social creatures. Collaboration and mutuality. Working together so that the work isn't as much, but also working together in ways that feel mutual and fair, makes people feel valued, makes them feel like their time is more valued, and makes them feel like they want to invest more in a system. Empowerment, voice, and choice. If you're embedded in a system, but nothing you care about ever happens, and nothing that you're working towards has other people's attention, it makes it very hard to feel valuable and caring. So, Giving learners places where their voice matters, where they have choice in how things are going and in their learning, and their ideas and perspectives get integrated in, can be a very trauma-informed approach. Finally, addressing current inequity. Now, they in SAMHSA listed as cultural, historical, and gender issues. And I think that when you look at all of those issues, those are issues of equity and issues of equity in the moment and how they're affecting the current learning situation. So if you address those in the current learning situation where people think, feel things are unfair to them, they're going to have more time and energy to explore the learning situation. Now these six principles can be used to improve just about any learning situation. But you can't pay attention to all of them at the same time in every learning situation. So just as rules of thumb, I've given you some prioritizing uh, guidelines. When you're planning a learning situation and you want to include more trauma-informed approaches, try to identify a few characteristics of the situation. One, which principles are being violated the most? The amount of violation is going to affect people more intensely. Secondly, which principles are the easiest to enact changes to build? How can you quickly make a difference? How can you easily make a difference? What's the less, least effort you can do to make a difference and still have that change be meaningful? Finally, you want to consider which violations are causing the most damage. Because 
you'll want to pay attention to the area people are hurting the most. If you pay attention to things people only kind of care about, they're not going to recognize your energy and your effort nearly as much as if you do something that helps with a problem that's causing a severe violation of safety. Now, I have some guiding questions for these six trauma-informed approaches, and I'm going to come back to these in one second because we're going to be doing this reflection question of can you think uh, about a few places where you might apply a trauma-informed approach to your instruction to support your learner? And I'm going to ask you to share your teaching context and how you think a trauma-informed perspective might help you. Hannah, Hannah, do you want to give folks a few moments to think about this and share in the text chat? Um, oh, Manju asked, can you please show the questions? So just go back a slide. Cool. So we already have one around um, peer grading. Uh, so Heinrich says group activities, especially peer grading online, can cause a lot, create a lot of trauma. Uh, the guidelines shared can really help in, in how to properly design these activities, especially online. Um, so we were just talking about, you know, how these activities could be designed with these uh, strategies uh, in mind. Maybe you want to keep it on the previous slide. I think folks are thinking using that. So the reason I was putting it on this slide is because it includes guiding questions of how you, what you're looking at. For example, collaboration and mutuality, the guiding question would be, how can you have people working together and sharing work fairly between group members? And thinking about it in that frame, what class do you have? What instructional method are you, what instructional activity are you doing where you could incorporate some group or collaborative work that gets split in fair ways? Linda was saying she thinks trauma informed practices could be good for English as a second language student particularly in a classroom where there's a large number of refugee students. That makes a lot of sense. Manju says, are faculty members traumatized when they have outliers in class? Faculty trauma is actually going to be what we talk about next. There is definitely trauma associated with our work as well. Uh, Sylvia says, giving learners a choice of assignments or optional assignments gives students some agency in the course. Very definitely. So Mohun says, how do we move a child to safety when say he or she is going through a situation of someone deceased in her family? That's a good question and it will depend on your learning situation. The key is finding a safe, comfortable way to have that person feel supported and not have to interact with the big group at the same time. Uh, one technique people sometimes use is having a partner go outside of the room with the student that has been having some sort of a trauma reaction and supporting them through it. Um, giving them a little bit of time or space alone can be another way. Having them go speak to a counselor so that they have immediate support could be another. So.
I'm seeing a lot of comments about people that are seen as outliers. Can I have someone explain the concept a little more clearly so I know exactly what you mean by that? Okay, maybe someone can elaborate, but to my understanding, um, someone who's not, um, you know, the idealized or mainstream participant in a space, depending on your context. In that framing, I very much understand. And that's an area where one of my favorite ways to build that is to build in the area of safety and trying to make group rules, group uh, guiding principles, group standards that people treat people within a group a certain way and holding people accountable to it. So just like at the beginning of this talk, I mentioned that psychological safety was really important in talking about trauma and that I asked they there was kindness in the interactions on this call. Setting up a group for psychological safety at the beginning of a learning situation and creating some group norms and rules about what is acceptable in social emotional interactions for that group learning can be a very powerful way of keeping outliers. They may be outliers in other environments, but making them part of the learning community. So I'm seeing that sometimes outliers can be very excelling students, and the term could also be used with neurodiverse students. So uh, there was a comment in the chat about our strategies such as meditation, visualization. Do they also go hand in hand if the proper resource person is available? Very definitely having an expert in helping a dysregulated person re-regulate by something like meditation or visualization are exceedingly powerful techniques. And if you have someone who can help your learners re-regulate if they're dysregulated, that's a great help to the learning situation. Okay, I think that this is a good point to move from thinking of the trauma-informed approaches in the classroom to move on a little bit to thinking about secondary traumatic stress. Secondary traumatic stress is the emotional duress, the result from reacting to the first-hand trauma reactions of another person. Trying to help traumatized individuals can lead to secondary traumatic stress reactions that can greatly affect your own social emotional well-being. I'm sure anyone who has had experience in the classroom has had a student at some time break down and remembers how that felt to them as an individual and how many hours after the learning situation they were dysregulated, how they might not have had an easy time getting to sleep. I know I have had students break down that I didn't know how to handle and it actually bothered me for weeks at a time. We are not immune and unfortunately, any work in helping professions in, means that you are going to be exposed to secondary traumatic stress because your work is to help people through things that are hard. And you're going to see people that are going through trauma. And you are, as a human, going to be affected by that. And there is no way to do work in the helping profession without getting affected by the learning situation. It's just impossible. So that gets you to the topic of 
dealing with your own trauma reminders. There are times during instruction where you encounter something that activates your own trauma reminder. The key to dealing with this, especially in the moment, is one, identify that you are dysregulated. And two, find ways to re-regulate yourself. Now at times this can involve discovering the source of the dysregulation. Other times you just need to work at re-regulating. So what are the signs that you might be dysregulated? Maybe you're breathing more heavily. Maybe your heartbeat has gotten rapid. Maybe your mouth has gotten really dry or your hands have gotten sweaty. Maybe you can't think of the next thing you're trying to say. All of these are signs of dysregulation. So in the moment, as you're feeling these differences in yourself, the key is recognizing I am feeling this and then devoting some attention in the moment to slowing down your breath, to calming yourself down, to closing your eyes for a second, and taking a deep, deep breath and feeling the ground beneath your feet and feeling yourself in your body, giving you control over your mind in the situation. In the moment, these steps are very important, especially since when we're dealing with a learning situation where we're dysregulated, very often we're in the position where we have someone else who is very dysregulated, and that has caused us to be dysregulated. And we still have to deal with this other dysregulated person who usually doesn't have the skills to re-regulate themselves. So if we have the skills to re-regulate ourselves and then support the learner, it's gonna be a much more positive outcome than if both of us are just very dysregulated for the whole interaction. Now, some of this work needs to be done in the moment, but other parts of this work are more long-term. In the long-term, you get better at ha handling secondary traumatic stress when you practice the skills of identifying when you are experiencing secondary traumatic stress reactions and re-regulating yourself after dysregulation. Again, as I mentioned at the very, very beginning, when are you gonna practice these skills? You're going to practice these skills when you're calm. You're going to practice these skills when you're relaxed. When you're already dysregulated, it's helpful to have the re-regulating skills already automatic instead of controlled because the controlled attention during the dysregulation is really hard to manage. So practice slowing yourself down. Practice being okay with being uncomfortable. Identify when you are reacting. Spend some time reflecting and reasoning about the sources of your emotional reaction. I'm gonna spend a little bit of time looking at the chat because a number of things have been added. Okay, it seems like it's a side conversation that we'll bring up in a second because I think it's time for a discussion. So this is the majority of the information I'd planned on sharing. I have a few other things depending on where our conversation goes for the next 15 minutes, but I'd love to discuss some of the things that have come up hear some people's perspectives on these ideas and see how people think that this information might be useful for them in their learning context. Yeah, and would you like folks to take the mic? Uh, is that an option? That is definitely an option. Great, so folks, if you wanna take the mic, please type M into the text chat and we can upgrade you. Um, I know Heinrich has shared quite interesting things around you know, issues around peer support um, and a previous uh, 
comment you shared was also around that. Uh, Manju also had talked to, you know, asked around, you know, psychology, made the point that sometimes students are pushed to psychological treatment. Um, so I guess, you know, questioning why that is so. So yeah, folks, feel free to type questions in the text chat or type M to take the mic. So Manju, do you want to explain a little bit about what you mean in your question? Was it? Hi, Manchu, we hear you. Um, hi there, this is Manju here. Are you able to hear me? Yes, yes we can we hear are. you. Nice. Uh, it's a wonderful session. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Ms. Hannah and Nicola. Uh, well, uh, I would like to explain why students are sometimes pushed into psychological treatment. Like when a student experiences uh, traumatic stress and are slightly depressed, see, uh, and they're not able to attend classes, you know, and when students um, go to the health center uh, saying about uh, their, their anxiety, when they share about anxiety or whatever, they are pushed into psychological treatment. Uh, so that, you know, the anxiety level comes down and so on. So like, um, I just want to ask you, like, if it is right for a student to be pushed to uh, medicines when he or she is experiencing, you know, traumatic uh, stress or whatever. So I guess I would frame it as, as the educators, our role is to try to make the educational situation as positive mm -hmm. as possible for these kids for these yeah. learners, whatever age they are. Mm -hmm. And I don't have the expertise to make decisions on who should be getting medication and who shouldn't. Yes. However, yeah, the more like trauma informed everything is along the process, yeah. the more trauma informed the learning situation is, the yeah. less and likely also... that students will need further help. And anybody who goes to a psychiatrist or a psychologist would be prescribed for some treatment in the sense, like if I go and say I'm anxious, they would immediately give a antidepressant or whatever. Like I'm a person who doesn't believe in such things. I feel like, you know, you should give ample space, time and counseling and students can get out of that situation rather than this. And uh, like, I, wa I, I, I wanted to know like if it is right for them to have such sort of treatment. And uh, like, what is this cognitive behavior therapy? Like, do you think uh, such therapies are important for instructional designers and um, students who are pursuing that? So cognitive behavioral therapy mm. is a good support for mm. people that have so many emotional and psychological uh, reactions that they need outside support. And mm -hmm. a lot of the training yourself to re-regulate are mm -hmm. skills that are specifically taught in cognitive behavioral therapy. And so teaching the individual how to slow their own breathing down is mm -hmm. something where you can have a therapist teaching a client how to do that. And that is part of the cognitive behavioral support. So do you think uh, students, uh, it's good for students to undergo such therapy? I think that that's too big of a question for um, a question on how trauma affects learning. Hmm. But I can say that when you're thinking about how trauma affects learning in your learning situation, the hmm. better you help support your learner, hmm. the less likely they are to need outside help the better everyone feels supported, feels safe, feels like things are transparent and mm -hmm. trustworthy, 
feels mm. like they have the peer support, feels like they have the collaboration and mutuality, feels mm. like they have the empowerment voice and choice, and mm. feels like equity issues have been dealt with, mm -hmm. the less anxiety they're going to have, the mm. less discomfort they're going to have, and the less outside support they're going to need. So if you feel strongly about those areas, the mm -hmm. way you can support these students is uh -huh. by using a lot of trauma-informed approaches in your learning situations so uh -huh. they're less likely need to need the support in other places. The, uh, the trauma may not be caused by the instructions given by the faculty. It may be because of their personal issues, they're traumatized and they're depressed. And though they understand that, uh, you know, the system is trustworthy or transparent, though they understand, you know, they can get sufficient collaboration or whatever. So these uh, students were sometimes depressed. At that moment, they will not be able to realize this or they will not be able to connect with faculty or the system. Uh, I do not know if I'm clear. And uh, they're lost. They're lost. Like, uh, and I just want to know, like, what sort of uh, strategies faculty employ in order to get in touch with those students rather than punishing them for not attending classes and then suggesting for psychological treatment, etc. That's the easiest thing anybody can do, isn't it? So it sounds like one of the things you're discussing is mm. that there isn't enough communication and connection in the system huh. that as a lecturer, as a teacher, you feel like you know how to support your students. Yeah, and like, that's a place- when it, come to, uh, when it comes to graduate students, uh, like they think like the graduate students are old enough to manage. That is how, uh, like that's my perception. That's how faculty thinks probably. Like, you know, they should be able to manage uh, their personal issues and they should be able to balance. And sometimes I do hear them say like, oh, well, you're not able to adapt to the situation. Why don't you get back? Why don't you discontinue uh, such things? So it sounds like your organization could mm. use looking at trauma-informed approaches in terms of the way they're running their organization to make mm. these students feel more supported in mm. their, their graduate school process. And mm maybe also having very clear pathways identified where mm. people can get help if they need it, you mm. have conversations and support where they need it, and make mm. sure that those pathways for support are built in or identified to make that bridge shorter for the learners who are going through these things and need the support. Okay, one last thing. Do you think uh, students who experience traumatized stress can become better faculty members? <laughs> I think that any human who spends some reflexive time thinking mm. about how their world and their context affects them mm. and how other people's worlds and contexts might affect other people mm. is going to be a better teacher than if they don't spend the time and the energy thinking of these things. Though the experience is pretty painful, I, th <laughs> I think they'll make better faculty members, right? They'll at least not try to push people into such situations. Exactly. So yeah, Thank you so much, Anna. I've taken a lot of your time. I think like there are so many other participants who may need a lot of suggestions from you. Uh, so that was wonderful. Thank you, Manju. So we've got a really interesting case from Heinrich, and I think to, uh, going from students to, to lecturers, he asks, how do we create brief debriefing moments for lecturers in online teaching? So COVID-19 is causing a lot of moments, he says, where lecturers feel overwhelmed and traumatized due to the fact that they simply have been thrown into the deep unknown world of online teaching for the first time. Should trauma-informed awareness be structured in a course design itself, or does the key lie uh, with the well-trained? Uh. So I think some of my response to Manju goes to some of that. The idea that we all know that this is causing moments where people are feeling overwhelmed and traumatized. And we all know the trauma-informed approaches that might support them. And it makes sense as a 
community of lecturers to figure out ways of supporting each other. And that collaboration and mutuality can be a very big one. That my workplace has intentionally set up informal hangout times so that we can talk and hear what's going on in each other's worlds and just be together online. But yes, definitely it doesn't just count with being well-trained yourself. It's in bringing those trauma-informed awareness to the structure of the course and to the structure of your overall organization. I think all three of those levels will be greatly, greatly supported with trauma-informed approaches. Sylvia says that it mm. seems to me that instructor flexibility can also be helpful. For instance, being willing to accept assignments late. That is a big part of making, helping in secondary adversity situations, especially, where people have one trauma and then they have all these other problems that suddenly make their schedule and their time not make sense. If a teacher is able to be flexible and willing to ex accept assignments late or even alternative assignments, I mean, the real goal is making sure the learning was reached. Um, mm. That can be very, very helpful in a learning situation, yes. Yeah, and I see uh, Sylvia has typed M, so I think she wants to take the mic. So go oh, for it, Sylvia. Oh, uh, thank you. Uh, super interesting discussion, everybody. Um, you know, I was referring to kind of what uh, Hannah was just saying. We, At our university, we had a lot of the informal hangout spaces and our faculty felt super supported and they could just ask anything. Uh, it was traumatic. We had, you know, people crying, you know, because they were so overwhelmed and uh, we all worked through it. So I, I felt pretty good about that. Uh, but I was actually thinking about a situation I had when I, I did, I worked as an online instructor, you know, completely online degree program. And there was a student who had mental health issues, uh, older student, former, uh, you know, war veteran, and he really disrupted the whole class. And uh, it was very difficult. And I, I felt traumatized by having to deal with him. And how was I going to work with these other students who were also uh, taken aback at some of the things he was saying? Um, in the end, you know, it, I worked a lot with the counselors, uh, our student advisor counselor, and we also brought in the Veterans Administration uh, office on campus um, to try to try to work through a lot of these issues, and it and it was somewhat helpful. Thank you, Sylvia. That gives information about not only how traumatic it can be to have something like this in, happening in your classroom, but also how these there's layers of complexity on it. How it's not just the one traumatized student, but how it's affecting you, how it's re affecting other students and the learning environment. And the idea that using a multi-tiered approach where you're using universal design for all learners with a trauma-informed approach in the classroom level, and then for students that need more support, there are additional levels of support for those in the greater need. Uh, we have that multi-tiered system in much of the United States with how we set up our educational system. Hmm. Yeah, Hannah, we've got a question from Muhan who asked, do we have established recognized uh, regulating practice techniques that can be universally uh, applied? He says, uh, from our perspective, uh, do they always work or many times are we only able to de-stress these during, uh, students during a session, but they re relapse as soon as they return to the environment? Because traumatic stress is an automatic reaction of the body that needs to be identified and re-regulated. When you learn how to re-regulate yourself, you will have less instances where you will need outside support for regulation. When a little baby is overwhelmed and in an automatic reaction, you don't try to 
yell at the baby to get the baby to calm down. You hug the baby and you use your calm to calm the baby. When the child gets older, you still, you're going to use your calm, your reasoning in the moment. And then there are a number of regulating techniques that have been very well built in the mental health field that are successful for a number of people. And it does make sense to spend some time learning some of these techniques for yourself and seeing what techniques can be incorporated in a classroom setting in ways that make sense. Not all of them might, because some of them might take you too much into the reflective space instead of in the learning space. But there are definitely ways to incorporate some traumatic uh, stress-informed practices, even into moment-to-moment -moment interaction. For example, during COVID-19, there's been a lot of stress at the very beginning of learning situations. If you're doing a call and everyone is feeling very, very stressed, you might, after spending a couple of minutes just emotionally connecting and sharing greetings and a little bit about what's going on, you might take a moment and have everyone ground themselves and practice a little bit of breathing together before they start on the work task at hand to create that new shared space for the work at hand. We are almost at the hour mark, so I wanted to let use the last few minutes to try to think about how we can continue these conversations. I've given you a very brief introduction into traumatic stress and how it might influence the learning situation. But these conversations are huge, and we need to figure out ways of incorporating this information more generally into our day-to-day -day practice. Where or how might we be able to bring these up more? Uh, yes, and just a heads up that we've got a link to our, um, a link to our survey for some feedback. Uh, we put the link in the in the chat. So we'd appreciate some some feedback um, about the session. Um, so please complete that form. It's really, really short. I think there are about four or five um, questions. And most of them are tick box. Um, so there was an interesting one here, Hannah, actually, just I, I know we're nearly on the hour, but if uh, it was, can you suggest instructional strategies or pedagogy that can reduce dropout from courses due to traumatic stress? So those six trauma-informed approaches are the instructional strategies. If students are less traumatized because you have thought about what might exacerbate their trauma in the classroom, and you have planned your instruction to minimize their traumatic reactions to it, you are going to have students that are more successful in their learning. And if you're still getting too many dropouts, incorporate more of them. And if you're still getting too many dropouts, incorporate more of them. The system is not always, does not always feel like a safe space, but you can create learning spaces that do feel safe. Uh, the six trauma-informed approaches, sure, I can go back to that. And I think we are at the hour. Um, I can stay on a few extra minutes if people have any other questions, but I wanted to take the time to thank you for attending. And I really appreciated this conversation and getting to share the trauma-informed approaches with you. Yes, and thank you, Hannah, for being keen to present um, for this collaborative event um, offered uh, as a collaboration between the Emerge Africa and AECT Culture, Learning and Technology Division. Um, so thanks, thanks, Hannah. I think there's a lot of, you've given us a lot of th uh, food for thought and definitely uh, these guiding questions and strategies, I think is going to be useful to 
anyone in these networks and beyond. We look forward towards more sessions. <laughs> Maybe someday I'll talk about how I think of project-based learning as one of the best ways of framing trauma-informed approaches. Yeah, sure. That, that would be really interesting. In fact, I love experiential learning and project-based activities. Because they allow for incorporating these techniques so highly, it's my favorite way to build in uh, trauma-informed education. Yeah, and there's a lot of uh, learning happening unconsciously, right? When you use these two strategies. So folks, if you need to be anywhere else, um, uh, we, you know, you feel free to, to leave. The first session has officially ended, um, but we're just uh, sticking around if there are any, any final questions. So Hannah, you want to say something about this? I definitely didn't have time for this during the talk. Um, it doesn't align as well, but I'm living in the United States. And right now, there's a very clear lens on focus on racism and trying to create a less racist society. And this social emotional learning idea about getting feedback associated with anti race uh, being racist, to build a more anti-racist society, collect, connects very deeply to thinking about trauma reactions and being in control of them and regulating them yourself. So I think I'm just going to end by reading this quote because I'm loving it so much these days and I feel like it confronts the issue of racism so well. How, where, and when you give me feedback is irrelevant. It is the feedback I want and need. Understanding that it is hard to give, I will take it any way I can get. From my position of social, cultural, and institutional white power and privilege, I am perfectly safe and I can handle it. If I cannot handle it, it is on me to build my racial stamina. <laughs> awesome. So I'm hoping that a lot of the re-regulation techniques that you're hearing about and we talked about today can also be reflexive techniques in getting negative feedback from other areas that might cause trauma reactions in yourself when you don't want those trauma reactions. For instance, being told you've done something that is racist. You will have a tr might have a trauma reaction and not feel safe and feel hurting because your identity has been challenged. But giving you that information is very hard for the person. So the better you are at keeping yourself regulated while you're receiving it, the more productive and positive that conversation is going to be. Hannah, like, um, can you just help me with the previous slide, please? I know like uh, you've spent a lot of time with us, but then uh, I would like to look at the last two points. Thank you so much. Not a problem. So sweet of you.